Hello again, everyone. I'm still Porter Anderson uh, <laughs> after, after that break. Glad to see you with us. Uh, we have such a wonderful person to talk with here. This is, this is a presentation from Publishing Perspectives, of which I am the editor-in-chief. If you don't know, we are the news medium of Frankfurter Buchmesse. And our emphasis is on the international industry. Thank you for the water, Jesus. And uh, we cover as much as we can of what's happening at the international level and at the scale of this amazing industry as it crosses its borders. Uh, one of the people that we like to talk to the most is Jesus Badenestel for you because he comes to us with great candor. Now I'm setting him up a little bit for our expectations here, you see. But he speaks to us in a way that, that some publishers are not as comfortable doing. He tells us where the pressure points are, where the great successes are, and you get a very rounded understanding of what's happening. As the CEO of Planeta's book division, for decades, this man has seen so many of the challenges that all of us have watched play out. He's seen the great moments, the not so great moments, and he has a great deal to tell us. We've been talking back and forth before we got here today. Um, this is a fascinating conversation. I hope that you'll enjoy as much as I'm going to. Jesus, I, I would love to just get your sense for, and I'm, I'm slightly surprising you with this. I hope it's all right. But we are looking at such a complex uh, evocation of difficulty coming at us right now. Um, I'm thinking of Game of Thrones, you know, winter is coming, and we're starting to hear this with a whole new meaning, right? Because there is such economic uh, strain up ahead for so many of our markets. Um, there is also still quite a question, we're hearing a lot of this from our public health friends in the States, of the virus making a resurgence with new variants. I mean, will we ever be free of this thing? Uh, probably not, we won't be free of it. The combination could be much more difficult than many of us had hoped it would be as we go into this fall. Give us your picture, just so we have a sense for the outlook here, and then we'll start talking about some of the great successes that Planeta's having. Thank you very much, Porter, and thank you, thank you very, all of you for being part of the audience this morning. I mean, I see lots of friends, most of you know as much as I do, so that will be like kind of a shared conversation. But uh, coming back to Porter's point, I think that we have to start recognizing that in Europe, uh, North America, we are living a, a very good times in terms of uh, publishing. I mean, markets have been booming those for those past two years, although the perspective, uh, future, the perspective in the near future is quite uncertain. Uh, we have seen growth of 15 to 20 percent almost in all countries, with one exception, one big exception, which is Germany. Germany is a country in which today uh, the revenues of the sector are still a little bit below 2% of those of 2019, and that's the only exception. For all the rest of the major countries, including also all the countries in Latin America, which we also serve, and here is Jose Calafel, who does it directly. And uh, I mean, we, are, we have been growth. So what is going to happen? I think that we can be kind of uh, expectant, and we have some time. I mean, in most of our societies, Crisis for the book industry arrive a little bit later than for the rest of the sectors. Uh, we, all, we always talk about resiliency of the, of the, of the book uh, industry. And this is because we, most of the books are bought by the most educated and affluent part of the society. It's true that today, with readership le levels in, in most countries uh, approaching to 70% or even above those numbers, we go to an ample part of the society, but we go to the better part of the society, which feels less and later the impacts of crisis. In any event, we have to prepare for some, some times which will be less good than today. But we also have new tools. I mean, uh, 10 years ago, we had printed books, and the only response possible for moments of crisis was the pocketbook. I mean, was the pocketbook, which was the, the cheap category to address some, some readers that couldn't afford to buy books in difficult moments. Today, we have also digital formats, and we have also pocketbooks, and we have subscription models, and we have many things that we didn't have before. So I think that as an industry, and we have e-commerce. So as an industry, we have more tools than we had ever before. And I think that this is, a, this is good news for us and should make us quite comfortable and quite confident in overcoming the, the difficulties that probably are, are here to come. 
I, I heard this echoed um, uh, when I was speaking with Johnny Geller, the uh, literary agent who's based in London and who is now a part of UTA, the Hollywood-based United Talent Agency that's so powerful. And he, as he looks at books to film and that development, he also watches his fellow uh, books people, his fellow books professionals, agents and professionals, in their reactions to Amazon. And when you speak of the tools we have now, the digital tools, one of the most telling was that during the pandemic, he suddenly had publishers all over London saying to him, thank God for Amazon, <laughs> because that was the way they could sell books. It's a very interesting thing, and this is not the way they had felt about Amazon before. And so something of the understanding of the digital capability was improved in that. There are still great problems with Amazon, of course. But nevertheless, this was an interesting transitional point for many publishers who began to understand that in the cultures and the markets in which Amazon is such a heavy force, it was useful in those regards. It had trained those populations to make digital purchases. And this was very helpful to many of those publishers. Let's, with, with your good comments in mind, and I like your, your point too about the time, that we don't have to feel that everything's gonna hit us in the face in the next hour and a half, right? When, when we talk about this kind of outlook as we're trying to get it, talk to us a little bit about the impact of the pandemic as we have seen it so far on your industry and on your company. Uh, tell us what, what that looks like, Jesus. Well, I think, yeah, it's talking about an issue that has uh, worried all of us. Today, happily, I mean, we are back to normal situation, but it is true that in, back in March, back in March 2020, all of us thought that the prospects of the industry were going to be uh, very dark. Uh, all of us had to make like a new budgets, all of us underestimate the reality, because the reality was that the book has come a lot stronger than it entered into the pandemics. So the book has survived very well the pandemics and has, do, has done so because uh, the leisure that the book uh, gives all readers, it's in, in social terms very accept, acceptable with very little risk. I mean, read, reading is something that we, you do alone E-commerce has helped a lot initially because people could buy books from home and that was a big thing, especially in, in times in Spain was three months in which uh, we had a lockdown of books, bookshops. That was very difficult. Also digital formats, uh, both e-books and in a special manner, audio books have played a very big role. But the situation is that in terms of, uh, of uh, strength of the industry, I think uh, the book has come even better in terms of organization and our people, which is something that matters pretty much a lot to us, the way of working has changed a lot. Yeah. Has changed a lot yeah. in our organization. The marketing we do, social networks are increasingly and very, very important. The way we make our books arrive to readers have also changed. So everything has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And the industry has converged again. We always talk about convergence of content industry. Today, this is a reality. I mean, for example, we are devoting part of our efforts to bring our books, our good stories, to uh, series and, um, and movies. And this is something which is successful as well. And uh, in the end, it is also feeding back the, the sale of books. So I think that, and also it's an important thing which we, I think we tend to underestimate, which is the qualitative importance of books in today's lives. In Spain, when people were asked about what what helped them most in terms of uh, overcoming the pandemics was family, friends, and books. So and not necessarily in that order. Right. And, and I think that being one of the three, it was very important for the industry and for us as publishers and for authors, of course. This, this is fascinating input and so heartening, isn't it? I, I have also seen another very interesting thing coming across in that as more of our people in the United States market and several of the others that are very Netflix dominated, we also have Hulu, we have Amazon's own Prime um, operation, we have several streamers who are working very hard on our markets um, to capture the time that everyone spends with them. What we're seeing is more and more international work we are watching in the United States pieces that are originating in Spain and are being rolled out on the same day they open in Spain in the United States in English. And so suddenly we have massive audiences watching content 
coming in from Spain, coming in from other Spanish language countries all over the world. And this is very exciting. It, in a way, we look at Netflix sometimes like we do with Amazon. We go, oh, God, they're taking so many things away from us. This may be one way they're giving back to us. They're actually helping our readers and our audiences at large understand the value of other cult cultures' storytelling, which is great to see. So I'm hoping that trend continues, the internationalization of the books to film story. When, when you look at this kind of, of allocation, though, to, to the time spent reading um, and sort of a rediscovery of reading for some, the friends, the families, and books trend, how do you see it now? Is it hanging on? Are they continuing to read more? Yeah, uh, the, the the short question is that it has been coming down a little bit, but it's yep. uh, it's higher than before. So, sure. and, and the real data are before the pandemics in Spain. Uh, in Spain, we have 60, 64 percent of uh, of readers, of frequent readers. I mean, the way we we conduct or they conduct the statistics is people that read at least uh, once per week, and 64 percent of Spaniards do so. Just the, as a matter of reference, in the States is approximately the same number. And in, in Germany, for example, approaches to 80%, and in France would be 76. So, but Spain is not that bad. I mean, the other day I was making some numbers, and in Spain we sell 70 million of books in terms of, uh, of printed books. In the States is in, 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 in trade uh, publishing. In the States it's 700 million, so it's 10 times more. So in terms of making comparison, the, the industry, the publishing industry in the States is 10 times in Spain, and in readership levels, it's comparable. But uh, what is, what has been different in, in, in Spain in this, in this sense, uh, sorry, can I miss your question now? It's, uh, that was a question? This is a, go right ahead, yeah. But, but no, so what was about the, the readership? I was saying, are they continuing uh, with the yes. pandemic energy? Before the pandemics, the, the time spent per, per, per week and mm. per people was six hours and 40, 40 uh -huh. minutes. 640. Okay. 640. After, in the pandemics, in the lockdown period, which was the highest peak, was eight hours and 30 minutes. Whoa. So it increased by more than 25%. Wow. And after the pandemics and after the lockdown, it's seven hours and 20 minutes. So ah. it's in between. Still so higher. Part of the, of the increasing of, of the industry yeah. is due to the fact that people are reading more heavily than before. So I, that's why we say that book is playing a more central role than before. That's fascinating. We're, we're seeing that they're hanging on to audiobook listening more, too. Maybe not so much ebooks. It seems to me that the print people who like a print book in their hand are going back to print. But the audio people who discovered audio for the first time and started listening to books, as well as podcasts or music, right, are sticking with it, particularly the guys, which is good. We always want to see more men and boys reading because women are our great readers. You know, is it, this is a good trend. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very good trend, and it's even more promising because of the fact that young readers are reading more than before. So in, in the case of young readers, uh, in recent times, this readership level is it's, uh, it's surpassing the 70% level, so it's close to 76%, which is the best way of ensuring readers for the future. So yeah, Boy. that's right. This is fantastic. It's such a success story. I mean, there, there's been so much movement since the recession which was very, very hard on the Spanish market, as, as I know everyone here yes. is aware. And, and the comeback is extraordinary. It's, it's an example to all of us. You're right. I mean, uh, after the Lehman Brothers crisis, mm -hmm. we lost a significant part of the market. Uh, but today, we are already in, well, a little bit higher than in the highest peak before the Lehman Brothers crisis. So we have recovered from that. And, and Part of this recovery is due now to the new digital formats. So at that time, we didn't have e-books, we didn't have a streaming, we didn't have audiobooks. And today, we have recovered the level in terms of printed books. And we have additionally, in addition to that, the new formats. So it's, it's, it's good. It's very inspiring. And one of the things I admire about the Spanish market, we were talking about this in the panel I was doing just before from WIPO, looking at data. Uh, what we find in so many of our markets now is an overhang, as I call it, of educational material. Um, there's so much of a market that goes into the educational, the textbook production, right? Mm -hmm. uh, might go into higher education, might go into school books for the kids, but in one way or the other, it's all geared on educational, and so much of it is connected, therefore, to government money, which can be very difficult in hard times. The Spanish market has kept much better balance 
it seems to me that you have such a strong trade tradition yes. that's hanging on and, and not being overwhelmed by the educational this side. This is a very well taken point. I mean, it's true. In Spain, we have a, a bookshop ecosystem, which is uh, very healthy. Yep. I mean, we have uh, more than 4,000 bookshops uh, in Spain, only in, in, which is a country of 45 million people. Mm. And today, independent bookstores represent close to 40% of total sales. Wow. This same number in UK or US would be less than 10%. Exactly. So it's a, it's a country in which uh, small and medium-sized uh, bookshops play a very important role. Mm -hmm. uh, we have in Spain half a million square meters of book exposition, which we think helps a lot people to discover uh, new books and to read. So yeah, this is very important. And what a testament that is to the centricity of the bookshop, not only to this industry, but to a culture. I, I'm sorry to tell you that we don't really have 4,000 bookshops in the United States, and we are 335 million people. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, we have one big bookshop, as you understand, <laughs> way up in the sky there, right? But it, it, is a, it is a fascinating thing that this is helping with that balance of educational to trade, to keep it even, to keep it strong, mm -hmm. and to stay so healthy with it. I, what are they reading now in terms of genre? What kind of interest do you see in your market? Uh, that's, that's a tricky question because, uh, well, in fact, making an analysis, uh, comparing 2022 with 2019, uh, the, ca the, the winner category, the winner gender, has been fiction. I mean, uh -huh. Fiction has been the, the one that has grown the most. It's true that fiction includes many things, including, for example, comics and manga, which among the fiction genres has been the one that has grown the most. But in the initial moments of the pandemics, nonfiction played also a very important role. Uh, and people wanted to know, like, essay reading was a popular activity. Uh, Cooking was also a popular activity, and the ones that make book, books by cooks, and we, we do. We had a very glorious times. And also children and young adult books have played a very important role because of what we said before. So it has been quite balanced. Probably the winner is fiction, and the second would be uh, young, uh, young adult and, and children's books. Yeah. That's fascinating. We, you know Stefano Mari from uh, Milano. Yes. I, I, I see him later today. And one of the things that he was telling us in the Venice conference um, back during the uh, winter is that in, in um, Italy, they have learned to put manga in the windows. And that brings the guys in to buy their comic books, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have also learned to put James Joyce right beside the comic books. <laughs> and so the boys are coming out with a comic book and Ulysses. It's, it's extraordinary. <laughs> but, now, actually, we call this bait and switch in the United States, and it's not considered quite so nice, but it's wonderful for reading. And <laughs> it's actually leading some of these young readers who love manga, they love their comics, to look at what's sitting right beside them, perhaps with a very beautiful, enticing cover, you know? Be good to your cover designers. <laughs> they can only be the thing that's selling Ulysses to a kid, right? <laughs> it's quite extraordinary, though. They're seeing this as a trend in the bookstores. Do you see this kind of thing? Do, do, the kid, do you see, I, I guess what I'm asking, you know the phrase gateway drug that yes. we have? Yes. Like if you smoke marijuana, the old fear used to be that you would go to hashish, right? Yes. I think that perhaps comics are gateway reading yeah. for youngsters who then look at James Joyce and get interested. Yeah? Yes. Well, I, I think that comics is a, it's a gate to new readers, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And they evolve. I mean, they, don't, they read a lot of comics because they are comic readers, but they occasionally also evolve and buy some things. I, well, probably Stefano is a much better marketer man than I am. In Spain, I don't think that comic readers buy Ulysses. I mean, I think it's, that's more complicated. We should make a very different cover, and probably that would be very ethical. But uh, yeah, I think that it's true. It's true that the, the advent of comics and the big, big growth experienced by this category is also uh, is leading uh, more sales of some other books. I mean, that's yeah. true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I think you put Cervantes right next to the comics. <laughs> well, country. Quixote that could be work. a comic as well. Yeah, that so, might uh, work. That nice. could be a comic, exactly. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit, Jesus, this is something we're always interested in in the States, obviously, about the relationship of the Spanish market and your company to Latin America. We, we know, I mean, in the, in the States, we are trying to understand Latin America better. It's many cultures, it's many dialects in Spanish, of course, this is not just one language, same as Arabic, so, same as so many, same as English. Um, what, how, do the two, how do the two parts of the kingdom, 
the two parts of the Spanish language kingdom work together uh, from your viewpoint? Uh, yeah, this is a very complex uh, question that admits uh, a lot of answers. Mm. And here we have also Jose Calafell, who is the CEO of, uh, of uh, Planeta in America. Yep. And, uh, and we work together. And, uh, and we are seeing, well, first of all, Latin America is not a single region. It's made of very different countries. Uh, we share different, many different things, starting with authorship. I mean, Latin America is producing more and more cutters. And this is not uh, uh, a mystery because... <clears throat> they have more than 500 million people, so it's just... <clears throat> Sorry. That's okay. Take your time. We may need something stronger to drink up here. That would be nice. <laughs> <clears throat> so, yes, we, we, we share the, many things. And uh, we also share the capacity of <clears throat> transferring books to the market. Like, for example, in Latin America... <clears throat> One thing which is different from Spain is the importance of e-commerce. Uh -huh. But it's not because e-commerce in general, it's because societies are different and the level of uh, bank activity is small. I mean, in terms of, uh, of being uh, part of the e-commerce, you need credit cards, you need an account, you need many things that we take for granted. And in Latin America, I don't... I don't can only be taken for granted, granted for a small part of the society. But now they are doing an excellent work, and it's also, I mean, this is a, a channel in we, to which we, have, we are forwarding books to readers. But the relationship is very, is very strong, and it is very strong in editorial, in marketing, in commercial skills, and, and both in, in the Latin America that speaks Spanish and also in Brazil. Uh, which is a subcontinent in itself, and it's very interesting, and we are also present there. Uh, and now, approaching Guadalajara Book Fair, which will be at, at the end of November, I mean, you see that the level of uh, interchange between Spain and, and, and Latin America is extremely high. So we are learning a lot from Latin America, and we are sharing a lot of experiences with them, which also makes them uh, to be able to to serve better their readers. So yes, it's a very strong. Uh, I know what you mean. I was, I was in Guadalajara last year. Uh, Marisol Schultz is the director who does such a fantastic job with that fair year after year. She, she's amazing. And I, I was there with the IPA, as a matter of fact. The pre-Voltaire was being delivered there. Mm -hmm. And it was an amazing experience because I found so many Spanish people. I found that people from Spain had gone to the fair, had gotten on the plane and come over. And the Latin American culture and, and representatives of the industries there were very proud of this. They understand that they are a force to be reckoned with, that Spain wants to recognize and come and talk to. And this, this is good to see. I think it is a healthy relationship. Yeah. Totally agree, and it's also one phenomenon that needs to be taken into account, is the importance of local publishing. Right. So uh, local readers want to hear local voices, yeah. and those are complemented also by authors uh, from abroad, both from internationally and from Spain, and same thing happens in Spain. Each time more, we try to bring uh, Latin American authors to Spain, the same way as we do with uh, North American authors, French authors, uh, UK authors, or Scandinavian authors, mm -hmm. so, or mm -hmm. Italian authors. So it's uh, this, this thing of... Uh, Trying to offer to the readers like a good catalog, it's it's any time is more important. It's fantastic. Yeah, the, the local author issue is is so important. Not only there, there there's a parallel in Africa, where they are inundated, of course, by translated material from our culture, but they're having a terrible time pushing forward their own authors. And the parallel of trying to support this is very important. Yeah. I think in both of these continents. In, in the United States, you, you can probably help me a little bit with this. I have found myself, we, we cover mainly the rest of the world, so we don't specifically cover the states, although we sit in the states, our, audio, our offices are there. I've tried to impress upon our, our English language publishers, uh, they are so great, they are so amazing in what they can do, that they should be publishing Spanish for our Spanish population. This is not always the case, though. They have been slow on the uptake here, which may be a very good opportunity for you <laughs> and for many other Spanish publishers. But I wonder what it takes to help a large English language, primarily English language culture like the States, understand the value and the, the opportunity of such a large Spanish language population within it. How does that develop? What do we do to make that move? Uh, it, it's, uh, it is a very good point. I think that there is a certain prejudice, uh, you know, yep. in this question, yep. and 
it's a prejudice based on facts, on hard facts, which is uh, when, you go, when you went like 10 years ago to a bookstore and you asked for a book in Spanish and they send you the, just very close to the bathroom in a, in a shelf which is very close to the, to the floor uh, and it was very difficult to find. Yeah. And this had a, a, an objective reason that was that the rotation of those books was very small. Yeah. So you, you couldn't put them in a better place in the bookstore. Mm -hmm. Today, with the with e-commerce the e and the digital formats, this has changed a lot. So right. today, there is no reason to, to, to not to publish in Spain because you have many readers uh, or potential readers which will be reading more, than, more and more. It is also true that many, a good chunk of the, of the Spanish-speaking population that goes to the States, they want to, and especially their kids, they want to be fluent in English and they, they embrace the new language. Right. But more and more, they also want to keep, I mean, you, you, you can speak more than one language. So they, they, can, they can also read in their own, in, in, in their own language, on the, in the home language. And there is one, one fact that I think that helps understand the, the opportunity, the sense of the opportunity, which is the, the TV stations. I mean, yes, right. they, they watch uh, Spanish TV or TV in Spanish. Yeah. So if they watch TV in Spanish, they could read books in Spanish. So, yeah. yep. I mean, we are also present in, in, in North America, mm -hmm. and we publish both in, in, in Spanish and in English, because it should do that way, the same yeah. way that in Spain, yeah. we publish in Spain, in Spanish and in Catalan, because we have readers that buy books in both languages. So I think that, yes, I think th this would be uh, uh, something very good, and I think that the new formats will help to transform that into reality. And it's important, I love the point you're making, and I, I wish I had more of my American colleagues here right now to hear it. Our basic problem has been the cultural bias, has been, in some cases, outright bigotry, and that has to change. It's something that we're wrestling with, as, as is all too evident, I'm afraid, in the United States. But we are trying, and, and I think this is an important point. Mm -hmm. And it's great that you're there. As you say, Univision is huge. Yeah. I mean, the, the culture is there. It's happening. There's nothing not to access. And the closer we can get these things to come together, the better. But mm -hmm. as you know, this is, this is a difficult area in the United States right now, the, the identity of the nation is something that's frightening many of our weaker citizens and causing great, tra uh, tr great trouble. Um, it, is a, it is a young nation struggling. Yeah, we suddenly have discovered how youthful we are, not in a good way. Let's talk about marketing for a moment because in, in COVID-19 there was, uh, I was, oh, I was saying, I think this is a um, Penguin Random House author, Castillo. Is it Javier Castillo? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, he, he gave me the most amazing story about how they, they wanted him to do, as the pandemic hit, they had to cancel a lot of his tours, yeah? Uh, and he couldn't speak to his, his fans and so he tried doing an online uh, I think it was Instagram. He did a little uh, uh, talk with his fans. They didn't think anybody would show up, and 6,000 people were waiting <laughs> when he logged in with his daughter sitting there beside him wondering what was going on, right? It, it's an amazing development, this kind of digital capability. Yes. How do we go forward with it in a good way as we come out of the pandemic, or we hope we do? I think it's a very easy answer. I mean, we have to keep the good things that we had from traditional marketing mm -hmm. before the pandemics, mm -hmm. and we have to couple them with the new digital skills that we have acquired. Mm -hmm. I mean, last week, we, we launched a book, which basically was digital marketing, and it's a book that will sell 200,000 copies in very few months. Wow. And it's, for example, we, we started uh, in Spain uh, publishing, uh, well, going to the social networks and, and publishing YouTubers. We have one example, which is very good because in this case it shows the importance of, of Latin America, which is called El Rubius. We have sold three million books by El Rubius to people that before didn't buy books because there were those ages between 15 and 24 years uh -huh. that they hardly bought books, and they bought three million, two of them in, in America and one in Spain. But still, it's a lot, and it's digital marketing because the readers are digital, yeah. and they are there. Yeah. And, but they, they, they bought and they buy printed books. So it, it's kind of a, it's a strange combination. I mean, you, you sell both digital formats and printed formats, mm -hmm. but you do a lot of uh, digital marketing. And, it's uh, fascinating. And that has changed as well the profiles of our people in our organizations, which I think it helps to make us better. I mean, right. we, we, sometimes when we talk about the, the evolution of the publishing industry, it seems that it's something that, we, that, that happens, that comes from from heaven, and it's not that, like that. I mean, I think that, that publishers 
are adapting or are trying to adapt themselves every day, both in the type of contents they publish, in the way they market, it, market them, in the way they make them arrive to, to readers. And this is what is, is sustaining our industry. I mean, it's not by luck. It's not that because of uh, COVID people read more. It's because publishers have also made many things different than before that helps this situation. And you have a very talented team that was able to make this adoption of digital marketing yes. and quickly deploy it. Um, that hasn't always been the case. Um, as, as, again, with the Mori School, I remember um, James Daunt, however, telling us he is the uh, managing director of Waterstones yeah. in England and of Bar Barnes & Noble in the United States. What a job. Bless his heart. And <laughs> but he's, he's quite brilliant. And he was saying that what was happening with his bookstore operators is that they had learned to get excited about digital marketing and that they're actually getting online. They're using Twitter. They're using TikTok. They're using everything they can get their hands on to communicate their events, their books. And it's working. Mm -hmm. And that they've gotten on board, as a good marketing team would do. Yes. Is, is this the case with your bookstores as well? As well. Uh, good. We, we own in Planeta, we own Casa de Libro, whose responsibility of management is from a colleague, right. and they are doing a great job. I mean, they are both in e-commerce and also in, in, in physical sales, and you're right. I mean, they use digital marketing both to foster digital sales and also printed book sales in bookstores. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think uh, yeah, this strategy is very good. And this morning I was talking also to a Norwegian friend and they also do the same thing. I mean, they are very advanced in terms of, uh, of uh, digital formats and in terms of the impact of the digital in, in total revenues. But in terms of the, of the strategy of the, of the shops that they have, the bookshops, is the same. So it's dual. It's both uh, digital and, and digital formats and printed formats, and, and of course. Yeah. So this has become the token of the realm in, in marketing, is to hang on to what we know of traditional marketing, but also keep these new tools that we exactly. have in the digital side. Exactly. It's, it's very important, especially as we go forward. The, the last thing I want to touch with you on briefly is, is the, the winter is coming issue, the fact that we're concerned about the costs as they're hitting, the printing, the supply chain issues, all of these things. How do you see positioning yourself to handle what we think is probably, if not a recessionary experience, something very economically struggling in, in, in the coming winter? Oh, I think you, we have to call things by, by their names. Right. And I think we will be confronting a recession. I don't know if we will be next year or, or in 2024, but right. it will come. As it, you're it, saying, not right away. It will affect also to the book industry. And it will be in, a, in, a, in an environment in which paper costs have risen a lot. Right. And we have problems of capacity in the printing industry. So right. we have two problems, not only problems of capacity, but also problems of cost, because energy costs have also soared. What is going to happen? Well, in our case in Spain, that has been even worse, because in the formats which my, you don't need uh, fast uh, printing, like for example, Pocket, mm -hmm. we have had many orders coming from the States and from France. So for, right. for Pocket books, they print them in Spain, they ship them back to the States, and they, they do their campaigns in the States, and the same with France. Mm -hmm. So we had really a, a bottleneck in terms of a printing capacity in Spain. Mm -hmm. What have you, we done? I think that in Planeta we reacted very well, and I think that most of the Spanish industry did. So we, we didn't have shortage of paper. We paid more for the paper, but we didn't have shortage. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, uh, of printing, of, we, have, uh, we have been worsen, or we have length uh, our time to reprint. I mean, when we need a reprint, and being back to the book, bookshop, it mm -hmm. takes longer than before. Now it's gradually coming back to normal, but still we are, it's taking longer than, than, than usual. Ah. And in terms of prices, we have been very conscious because we are, we are always trying not to impact all the, all the increasing costs in our books, because we think that if we do so, if we increase, I mean, many other sectors in Spain, especially food, and food is the one that probably uh, all types of food, have increased the, the prices from one day to the next. Yeah. We have uh, resisted to that. So we think that uh, if we, now that we have been the lack of investing in new readers, we cannot raise prices and lose those readers, right. because acquiring new readers is very costly. Yeah. So we prefer have slightly slow, lower margins, uh, maybe uh, increasing a little bit cost, but much less than inflation and much less than our own costs, and keep the readers. Because we think there are many things that we can do, even 
being more efficient inter internally. So our policy will be not to put the, because this morning, for example, I mean, this is a different country because they, they always say that Norwegians are like the, the blue-eyed uh, Arabs uh, because they have a lot of energy. Uh, and the, the price of a trade book in, in, in Oslo is between 35 and 40 euros. In Spain, it's half this amount because we are not that rich yeah. and we don't have that oil. Yeah. We have sun, but the sun will be the, the new oil <laughs> and, and less, less polluting. But, uh, yeah, but, but we are, I mean, we have prices which are among the lowest of uh, the most important markets, yeah. but still we are resisting to... To, to increase them a lot because we are very proud of this 66% of uh, readership that we have in the country. Yeah. And we don't want to go back to 50s. We want to go to 70s. And your readers will reward you for that. Um, this is another thing that Charlie Redmayne was saying this morning. The sensitivity of that price point is important. Yeah. They look to this as something they can afford. And if you make them think they cannot afford it, you're losing them again. So I think you're very smart with that, Jesus. Yeah, I think that's exactly the way to, to proceed. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. We're going to stop in about one minute. Is there a question before we stop for Jesus? Is there anyone here with something else they'd like to ask that we haven't gotten to? You all look very comfortable and satisfied. <laughs> good friends, uh, good friends. Good friends, you see. That always helps. <laughs> it's nice to have every one of you, too. Well, this has been a great conversation. Thank, thank you, you very much, much Jesus. It's so good to see you again. Thank you very and much. And thank you for your service on the advisory board at Frankfurt, too. This is one of our great people who's always behind the scenes, working with Jurgen and the team to make sure that everything you see here works as well as it's working. Mm -hmm. Astonishing. I'm still in awe, and I'm part of the staff myself. I see this from the inside, and I'm still in awe. So thank you. Congratulations thank you on the fair. Thank you, Porter. And always everything a, you're doing. Always a pleasure. Talking thank to you. you. You're so kind. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.